We're continuing our series of interviews about Bible design and publishing, and I don't care so much about the publishing aspect per se. I'm involved in it. It's absolutely necessary. There is a financial aspect that absolutely has to be considered or the Bibles aren't going to get made. But what really gets me excited is not the marketing and sales, but the actual product, the beautiful Bibles that aren't just beautiful, but functional and functional because they're beautiful. I have a hard time reading through Bibles that are ugly. I pull out my old comparative study Bible, for example, that I invested a ton of heart in, and I loved that thing. And I still do, but I can't bear to read it because the type is just so ugly. They just did not give it the attention that Bibles today get. Technology has advanced, and that's made it much easier. But there are other reasons for the growth of quality in Bible design. I think Crossway is one of the major reasons there. They got out in front and showed other publishers what can be done. And people like J. Mark Bertrand and his famous, though often moribund, Bible design blog have taken up the torch, have become cheerleaders for premium Bibles. And again, not just the beautiful leather and the nice book block and the other elements that go into making it a good tactile experience and into making the Bible something that is a treasured object. But I like the fact that Mark J. Mark Bertrand has given so much attention on the Bible Design blog, to which I've been a faithful subscriber for years now. He gives so much attention to Bible typography. I gave this presentation years ago. It's my most popular video still on YouTube, though about to be eclipsed by uh, my uh, Which Bible Translation is Best video. But I gave this uh, lecture at my church, Why Bible Typography Matters. And I have long been interested in this topic. J. Mark Bertrand is one of the biggest names um, outside of the publishing industry, just somebody who is a commentator on what's going on in Bible publishing. Um, I I tend to think that he hasn't been posting as much on his blog, in part because of his own success. The kinds of things that he was trying to promote are now thankfully common. 2K Denmark, we talked to Klaus Eric Krogh a few weeks ago. Uh, 2K Denmark has done excellent work, and now their work is accepted and expected pretty much, you know, anytime you put out a new Bible, uh, the the instances of ugly Bibles coming out has gone way down, especially, of course, from the major publishers. And a lot of that is due to the cheerleading work and to the thoughtful promotion of J. Mark Bertrand. Let's talk. It's really a delight to have a longtime acquaintance, somebody I feel like I know better than I probably do because I've read so many of his blog posts on the Bible Design blog, J. Mark Bertrand, to join me in talking about Bible typography and Bible design today. Can I just have you introduce yourself because you wear a number of hats and I don't know that I know what all of them are right now. Go ahead and just tell us who you are and how you serve the body of Christ. So I I should probably start mentioning uh, most recent developments. So I'm a teaching elder in the Presbyterian Church in America. So a pastor of a Presbyterian Church. I am a novelist uh, and author, and I'm also the writer behind Bible Design Blog, which is a blog dedicated to, I always say, the physical form of the good book. So I don't get into translation or interpretation so much as I focus on questions of design and manufacture of Bibles. Now, I have to ask right off, the Bible Design Blog's last post came before COVID. So all of us who are hoping for more posts, how likely is it and when's it going to happen? It's very likely. uh, In terms of the timing, it's hard for me to say. Uh, I feel like I'm always making excuses for why I'm not a diligent blogger, but I do intend to contribute more. Um, I think that my responsibilities combined with kind of the shifting landscape have, have taken the sense of urgency away from some of it, but, but absolutely. I mean, I have a lot of, uh, uh, good or bad to share. So you will see more from me there. That's great. That shifting landscape you refer to, if I understand you correctly, is a perfect segue into the first question I have for you, which is basically what shifted? So 
all the Bibles that my parents had growing up, if I recall correctly, were ugly and so ugly it you know I can bear, hardly bear to look at them you know looking back and I mean typographically ugly. It was just uh, two columns on that page. Every single verse was a paragraph. The typeface was not wisely chosen in my estimation. The various accoutrements on the page that were trying to add extra information were obtrusive. They weren't fading into the background and allowing you to really focus on the text. It really uh, messed up Bible reading, but we didn't know, and at the time, we didn't care. So how has that landscape change? What has shifted to make it so we have so many nice looking Bibles today? I think the big thing that's changed is a combination of, let's say, an aesthetic awareness combined with some technological advances. So everything around us, uh, the design of things has been much more considered than in the past. And at the same time, it's become a lot easier to create a new typesetting of the Bible. Many of those typesets that you would have grown up with could have been, you know, third and fourth generation. Like the Bible is just always that way. And you would even see in even nice editions where the, the type was broken because they'd been using those plates so long. And, and just the thought of of refreshing it was pretty alien. And certainly you wouldn't mess with the design because people expected the Bible to look the way that it looked, uh, like a reference book. And so what's happened, I think, is it's become easier for us to make the book look like a book meant to be read and not just you know, looking things up in it. That is my impression also. And yet I've, you know, I just talked to Klaus Eric Krog of 2K Denmark. I have to presume you know him. And he was so fascinating. He, I, I didn't really realize until I jumped into preparing this cover story for Bible Study Magazine that's going to come out in November, December, talking about Bible design and Bible type premium Bibles. I didn't know quite how many pies Klaus had his finger in. It's really fantastic. I mean, almost single-handedly, it seems, the guy has changed the Bible publishing world. I know there have been other factors, but I asked him this too. I tried to drill down in that. Like, could it have been just technology? Surely that played a role. How is it that the market, the people out there, who will never sit through my Why Bible Typography Matters YouTube video and will never hear the Bible Design blog. How is it that so many of them are changing their wants? Do you have any pontifications about that? I do think it is technologically related in a different way. So with the rise of eBooks, for example, our idea of what a physical book needs to be has changed. And so where when I started writing about this stuff, it was very difficult to convince people that they didn't need their physical Bible to have uh, all the, the extra apparatus that you were referring to. Um, people were convinced that if they didn't have all that stuff in the physical book, then when they needed it, it just wouldn't be there. Now we've got all that stuff on our phones and it's so much more easily accessible that way. And it's changed what we're willing to uh, accept or even desire in the physical form of the book. So even since you know 2007, I've seen a huge shift in the attitude of just ordinary people in terms of what features their Bible needs to have. So obviously, this is a very traditional. Uh, market and these innovations, I think, remain a niche in that market, but people are much more accepting of reader-friendly editions than they were even, you know, 10 years ago. And I don't have scientifically rigorous figures on this, but I have to believe, given my anecdotal experience of how many comments you get on Bible design blog posts, how many people are in my Everything Bibles Facebook group? How many people I see in church with nicer Bibles? Which is still where I'm seeing the, you know, the least number, the smallest percentage. It's in church. But online, there does seem to be this continual buzz about beautiful Bibles. I, I think that niche is growing, and I'm really rejoicing in that. And I think you nailed it. I think that I myself 
no longer need and therefore no longer want my printed Bibles, actually kind of in the rare times when I use them. And I'm not saying other people ought to be that way. That's just the way that I am. I kind of use mine for preaching and teaching. And it's mainly a symbol. I want people to see physically I'm preaching from the Bible or in my family devotions too. I could read it on my phone, but I actually want my children to connect, you know, psychologically, this physical object. Okay, dad is reading the Bible to us. But when I have those physical Bibles, I don't want any of that extraneous stuff because it's all so readily available to me in Logos Bible software. And of course, you know, I'm partial to Logos, but there's lots of other good stuff out there too that people can use on their phones and their tablets and their computers. So I, I recently got a premium Bible from uh, Zondervan they sent to me for this, and it's absolutely beautiful. 2K Denmark did it. And the only thing I would change is just take out the cross-references. Like, I don't need those. What, what's the, the purpose when I, it's quicker for me to pull up more cross-references and ones I'm already used to using on, on my phone. I, I think you're um, exactly right. And that segues into my next question. I put out this uh, um, Bible typography manifesto a number of years ago. I think I may have shared it with you. And I did this YouTube video, Why Bible Typography Matters. And you're way ahead of me. You're talking about that, all that stuff uh, for years before that. And I've been thinking about it for years before that. And what I've come to is, generally speaking, I prefer a single column paragraphed edition. And there are some, you know, variations that can happen. Where do you put the verse numbers? Do you have the verse numbers? But I pretty, I react pretty strongly now, emotionally, uh, to the point where I need to zip my lip when I see another Christian having a double column Bible. I react against that. Um, do you think tight, nerdy people are overreacting to complain about the way double column, every verse, a paragraph, additions of scripture enable or abet proof texting? I don't think it's an exaggeration at all. I, I Obviously, any point can be overstated, but we tend to be unconscious of the way that the design influences the way that we interact with the content. So for those of us who grew up with the traditional you know, verse by verse settings of the Bible. I, I always think of like the Schofield Bible as the classic. I remember seeing those as a kid. If you grew up with that, then you have in your mind like a way of relating to the text that's a little bit more atomized. It doesn't flow. The, the ideas don't flow in the text. And typically the solution to that, we would say is translation. But what I began to wonder is, could you take the same translation and by making the design reflect the kind of books that we're accustomed to reading, would that make an impact on readability? And in my, again, you know, it's anecdotal, it's not scientific, but in my limited experience, the answer to that question is yes, that you can take a difficult translation and make it easier by improving the design of it, making it a, a more readable design. It's not an accident. All of the books that you're accustomed to reading deeply look a certain way. You know, that is by design. And the Bible is a kind of outlier because it's a huge amount of text. And so we have to make the words really small. If we put them in double columns, we can pack more words onto the page and then need all of these helps to try to understand it and all of that. So all of that is well-intentioned, but each one of those benefits comes with a trade-off in terms of readability. And so if, if the goal is to have people read their Bibles, then everything we can do design-wise to make them more readable is beneficial. Yeah, I was recently ordained uh, at, at the very end of the COVID time as an assistant pastor at my church, and a longtime mentor came up for my ordination to preach my sermon, and my best friend came up to be on my ordination council. He's an elder at the church that I was in for a number of years while in school. It was a real privileged time for me. I, I It was more special than I could have imagined it really was. And the one moment when I felt the most ashamed, however, was when we were all talking afterwards and I said, you know, if I ever did become a senior pastor, 
I would really like to see if I could get the church, the entire church, for a whole year or maybe even two years to use readers' Bibles, even in church, so that my preaching is forced to fit that convention rather than the one that we're used to of the versification. And the reason I was ashamed, and I'm talking a little bit tongue in cheek here, was everybody just looked at me so strangely. Like that is just not worth spending whatever tiny amount of capital you have as a pastor, you know, with very skeptical people. Um, and one concern I've had too is, you know, Christians can be so prone to looking for whatever distinction exists between them and other Christians and turning that into a badge of honor and then a banner that they wave. Like, I'm not saying we would be a superior church by doing this. I'm just saying, I'd really like to see what would happen. Could you ever see that happening, number one? And what would be some of the benefits and detriments of that happening? If, you know, churches wholesale started using reader's Bibles in church, you know, because verse numbers didn't come in until the 1550s and chapter numbers didn't come in if I remember this correctly until the 1200s so if we zoomed back in time in one sense uh, what would be the benefits and detriments of that so I can answer this with a little bit of experience because at my church uh, every time a person joins our church we give them a reader's bible as as one of the things that Wonderful. we them with and we talk about why we're doing that, you know, what the, the benefits of that is. When they come to a worship service, the text of scripture, you know, everywhere in the liturgy, whether it's you know, in, in readings or for the sermon, everything is presented in like a, a reader's Bible format. So you're constantly interacting with the text minus all of the additions that you're used to seeing. And so we have a number of people in our church who use these Bibles, and even those who don't are accustomed to seeing our presentation of Scripture reflecting this. So what I would say is the, the benefits that you see are very connected to uh, like a, a shift in the way that we read. So we read the Bible more like we would read uh, a book. Uh, Anyone who's taken an English lit class knows that even without verse numbers, even without somebody going in and inserting, you know, carriage returns in long sentences, somehow professors and students are able to find the passage that they're interested in talking about, compare it to other passages, that sort of thing. Like this happens all the time in books that are not, you know, specially designed to facilitate it. So that's what happens when you have reader's Bibles. Your familiarity with the Bible comes to resemble your familiarity with other books. So you remember yeah, there's that passage about this, and I've got this memory of even where it is in the page and where it is kind of in the, the, the overall text of scripture. Depending on which reader's Bible I have, I'll even have a verse range at the top of every page, which makes it really easy to navigate in that way. So uh, what you lose, I suppose, is a little bit of speed when it comes to looking things up and a little bit of the ability to uh, jump. Like if I'm listening to a sermon and, or in, in my case, preaching one, and I refer to verse 13, and then jump ahead to verse 17. In a reader's edition, that shift is a little bit more difficult, right? You'll have to wait until I quote the words to know exactly where we are. That is significant though, in my opinion, compared to the benefits of having a, a knowledge of the text based on the ideas conveyed like the reference numbers that get you there. Let me bounce some of the benefits I foresee off of you and see if you agree. And I'm, I'm actually wanting people who are knowledgeable to push back against me if need be, because I really might do this. I, I may, Lord willing, be a pastor, a senior pastor someday, and I would like to try this. At the very least, just making sure everybody who joins the church gets a reader's Bible would be good. But one benefit I see is that the preacher himself, in this case it would be me, is forced to be, I think, much more self-conscious about how often he 
checks cross-references. I actually find that to be, generally speaking, a frustration in listening to preaching, that I, maybe it's just my tradition or the preachers I've happened to sit under, you know, wonderful men who preach the Bible well and I'm so appreciative of them and this is a very, very minor, you know, criticism or concern. But I'm concerned about the sheep around me too who aren't as knowledgeable about the Bible and we jump to, when we jump to so many cross-references, I just think it's easy to lose the thread. And if I had to, you know, if I was using a reader's Bible, I would be forced to be very careful about how often I check cross-references. That would be one benefit. Let me bounce that one off of you, and then after you reflect on it, I'll bounce another one off of you. What do you think about that benefit? I think it it is a benefit, and it is a real sort of result, because um, I've experienced that myself, where I'm much more conscious of, if I'm going to move to a parallel passage, I want a legitimate parallel, not just a sort of thematic resonance. I, we've all... I'm sure sat through sermons, which were kind of a, an exercise in lateral thinking, driven references, chain references, where we're kind of pulling from here, pulling from there, in a way that no reader of an epistle in the ancient church would have even been able to do. Right. Uh, I much prefer getting in deep in a passage that I'm focused on. And if I have to go somewhere else, limiting the number of jumps and, and really keeping it focused, uh, I think that's that's good practice regardless of, of Bible format. But readers' Bibles definitely encourage that good practice. Yeah, it, it reminds me of Neil Postman's comments about technology. You know, he says technologies lean a certain direction and they, you know, it's like they will out they're going to produce the results that are baked into their you know, design. That's one benefit. Another benefit of readers' Bibles that I anticipate is something that I can already do as a preacher, and I do teach Sunday school every single week, and I preach on a regular basis. And I, I very self-consciously avoid using chapter and verse numbers as a crutch to get people to the place I want to be. Instead, what I try to do is give the least amount of the, you know, address information as far as the numbers on the page and use that time to instead very briefly orient people to the context in which we're going to land. And one of the benefits of everybody using a reader's Bible is that every preacher would be forced to do that, to say, okay, here's this third paragraph in this new section in Paul's letter to the Romans. And what he's been doing is this, this, and this, and here he's making this move. I, I want to use even just two sentences to orient people like that when I do come to a cross-reference. I think a reader's Bible would make me do that, yes? Yeah, and the irony is a more textual way of dealing with the text, right? Where you're using the internal logic of the text as a way of orienting, instead of just relying on the, the numeric references. And, and I think that's not just um, like a benefit of readers' Bibles, but the kind of knowledge that you derive from doing that is so much better. Right? You're understanding the thought process of a Pauline epistle so that you can jump around as needed and understand kind of where you're at. So. Yeah, I, I do the same thing, and I think it is something that the, the format encourages. I'm sure there are ways to do it otherwise, but the format really encourages that kind of taking the time with the text. I will say, I was really inspired by uh, R.C. Sproul's example years ago, where he would cite passages in, in Scripture and give them their without always telling you where he was quoting from. And I think maybe inspired by the author of Hebrews, who was content to say, as someone somewhere said, instead of giving you, you know, all of these details, I, I gave myself permission to refer to passages in scripture that way. It didn't help me in my ordination exams where people still wanted me to be very precise. 
But in communicating scripture and in helping people orient themselves, I think it's been hugely beneficial. That is an excellent point. I hadn't thought of it like that, but I had found myself doing that as well. And even, okay, so in Logos Bible Software, we have this New Testament use of the Old Testament tool. And it's got this really simple, faceted browsing format that had has one really brilliant point baked into it that I sort of knew but didn't know, know until it was crystallized for me right there. And that is that you have quotations, you have allusions, and you have echoes. There are times when, just like we do with Shakespeare or the Bible, especially, of course, the Bible, we just kind of let its language inhabit our language, and little phrases come out. We're not necessarily saying, this is what this phrase meant in context. Sometimes we are, and then we might be more apt to quote a longer passage, but often it's just we're so immersed in the Bible, it's like Spurgeon, you know, he, if you prick him, he bleeds bibline. That's the way I want to be. Now, what is the, you probably get this question all the time, and I think I've seen you try to answer it on your Bible design blog, uh, or maybe avoid it. I can't remember. Okay, now's your chance. What is the one Bible format that you would still like to see that just hasn't been done yet? Is there one? Definitely. Um, it is one of my dreams to essentially be handed the the lever and, and make addition materialize. Uh, we definitely live in a wonderful time as far as uh, creative Bible design and, and various levels of quality. Uh, there's nothing to complain about, but there are some things where I feel uh, we have yet to kind of venture into. So I'm very interested in questions of how the physical Bible is used. So especially editions that uh, are innovative and, and don't really uh, work the way that traditionally the physical Bible has worked. So scripture journals, for example, are a fascinating area to me. And I, I think there are some ways to push into that realm a little better. So form fast stuff that I'm interested in. I'm also conscious of the fact that although we've had a great revival in typography it's it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger like uh we're losing the sense of a hand-sized bible a little bit and so when i see you know the fancy bibles that you're referring to being carried around in classrooms or at church uh they're pretty big you know sometimes a, a reader's bible can can be the size of a study bible and there's a real need, I think, to go back and look at the value of these smaller editions. I was uh, last week at a half price books in Texas, where for $5, I bought a Oxford Ruby King James edition bound in Morocco leather, and a beautiful limp binding that, that opened flat, wonderfully opaque paper. And, you know, that big, just just really, you could slip it into a pocket legitimately, it's readable, et cetera, et cetera. If that had been like a modern reader-friendly Bible, it would have to be a little bigger, but it wouldn't have to be as big as we're making them. So I'd, I'd love to see more innovation in form, but I'd especially love to see a return to like getting this pocket-sized Bibles right because I think doing one of those with quality materials and and you know well made it it uh, that's an addition that ends up being used not just kept in the box and brought out for display but but you take it with you so those are dreams of mine you know I'm, I've kind of I don't know, priced myself out of that market in a way because I'm so invested in digital Bible study tools. And like literally, you know, spent thousands of dollars of my hard-earned money when I was a very, very poor graduate student working as a graduate assistant in a library. I look back at my account like I can look at it here now that I work for Logos and I'm like, wow, where in the world did that money come from? And I don't regret spending a single cent of it. So I'm not carrying around physical Bibles like I used to. So I'm happy to have the one big one 
that really I just bring to church. And lately I've just been grabbing various ones and Crossways sent me their Greek English, you know, diglot and that's been good. I brought that in. Uh, I, I haven't thought really from the perspective of the normal church going Christian who doesn't have a massive Bible software library on every device that he or she carries. And I, so I think that kind of person you're talking about right there could really benefit. And I think you should talk to Klaus if you haven't already about this because he mentioned to me that merely by designing the type carefully, he was able to shave pages off of design, uh, Bible designs, and he was able to save the money that the publisher was spending, which wasn't very much in the first place, save that money they were spending on typography, hiring 2K Denmark, uh, because they didn't have to buy as much paper. And that same insight could go into the kind of edition you're talking about. Let me, let me answer my own question, bounce this off of you, and then I have a couple more questions for you. I, the, the, the format I would like to see more often um, would be a hybrid of the two kinds of formats that I, one, love the most, namely readers' Bibles, and two, recognize I ha can't get away from, and that is versified Bibles. So I have a new English Bible from, it's got to be the 70s, it might be the 60s. I got it through totally random means, it's a beautiful Bible, and it's set up like a reader's Bible, except the verse numbers are, like a lot of lit books, out in the margins. And the Traveris uh, from Skylar, although I'm not a big fan of those drop caps, I think they just shout a little too much, maybe way too much. Um, that's the only one I can think of uh, recently in major evangelical Bibles that's used that uh, format. And I think it combines the best of both worlds. You do sometimes need to be able to quickly reference something and I do lose the thread sometimes when I'm using my reader's Bible in church. I have to admit it. But if I had the verse numbers not just at the top of the page in a range, but uh, down the side of the column, I think that would get me there without obtruding into my reading experience. Why don't we see more of those, do you know? I think, you know, it was an early innovation. So when you think about the NEB, they were trying to do a lot of the things that uh, we're talking about right now. And taking those verse numbers and just moving them into the margin was their way of achieving that. I think probably the, the reason why that didn't become more popular is just there remains that question of where exactly does the verse begin in the line, uh, which in practice is an easy one to answer because it's always like where you see that sentence break or, I mean, it's right. not hard to tell, but I think the perception that it's difficult. When uh, the message remix was done in the early 2000s, it had a similar apparatus where they did, uh, like, I, I think it was verse ranges in the margin. Yes, I've got that sitting right here. Yeah, you're right. It's beautiful. Yeah, so that's helpful as well. I think there's something clean about not having them there. So it's a trade off between like the clean design and the usability. And I think the reality is that most people designing readers' Bibles are clean design people. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, we're the kind of people that are like, uh, we're gonna give you what you need, not what you want. And so right. there's like a there's kind of a, a, a desire not to go that route. Whereas, you know, Skylar, especially in that edition, you know, there's a nostalgia factor to yeah. those things and, yeah. and an openness to, um, you know, usability, even if it's not a pure expression of the idea of the reader's Bible. So I think that's maybe an instance of going back to an older solution and adopting it. But in an addition, that's already full of these callbacks to older Bibles anyway. I'm usually the purest there. I like the look of the clean block without that jagged edge created by numbers in the margins. But I'm thinking about people who tell me, oh, I could just never get rid of those verse numbers. I need them. I need to know where the verse starts. And I'm thinking, how could I help them? Um, or how could I come up with a sort of compromise that would get the main things I want into the hands of people in whatever church I might pastor? Um, without making them feel like, oh no, oh no, our pastor has stolen our verse numbers from us, out with him. 
that's that's why I need this sort of compromise edition. This is the beauty of living when we live because, you know, circa 2008, if a single column edition came out and it didn't get every detail right, you just wanted to weep bitter tears because the thought was, you know, this is going to fail and there will never be another. But now there's such a proliferation that you actually can realistically indulge the desire to just have multiple variations, you know? Why not have an edition that does that? Why not have an edition that's that's a little bit different in this way? Even if I don't like that feature, we're spoiled for choice now. And so it's possible to love the fact that people are publishing formats that I personally would not design, but I see the utility of it for, for other readers. So I've never Indeed. been one who thought everybody has to have the Bible this way. Sure. I think I've always felt uh, we just need enough to where it's possible for the good thing to exist. I think I have pulled a lot of my concern about Bible design over from my work on the King James Version. Because what I have observed is who are the people who are sort of left holding the bag after the rest of the church moves on to contemporary translations? It's often people who have the least in the way of other resources. So I literally, in, in outreach work in Greenville, South Carolina, ran to a homeless man outside of an abandoned building and like his first question to me when he could see that I was a churchy guy was, do you use the King James Version? And I'm just like laughing to myself. And I, I was the pastor of an outreach church and people who were just one step above homelessness, who were functionally illiterate, what Bible translation did they happen to end up with through, you know, whatever means, gift and award Bibles given out at some VBS 25 years ago. It was the King James Version. And the very first thing I did is, here's a new international reader's version, and we're all gonna use the same one so that I can reference the page number because they didn't know how to check cross-references. They were totally bowled over by the King James and by the self-pronouncing King James that would even divide up the word Jesus and put a little like acute accent on there to make sure everybody knows how to pronounce Jesus. I'm just slapping my forehead. But when it comes to bigger words like Mephibosheth, all of those marks just totally, you know, overwhelmed them. So I'm looking at the the weak and I'm, I don't know if I'm going to say oppressed, but when it came to Bible translations, they sort of were. The, the powers that be over them were not letting them have what they needed until I came along. I'm sort of looking at it the same way with Bible design. Um, it's the people who think about it least who actually need the most help. And that's why I am wanting to see the proportion of, you know, what kinds of uh, additions are used. I want to see that change in favor of at least as many of changes as possible toward, you know, uh, formats that encourage good reading practices. I, now that you mentioned that that's I'm kind of putting that together in my mind as, as to why I'm I'm so interested and that went on too long I'm too much of a talkative interviewer because I care about this stuff too much so let me move to another question what are the strengths and weaknesses of the codex technology printed paper Bibles flipping the pages versus digital technology for Bible reading and study what are your thoughts there yeah I mean I, I think it's it's still early days <laughs> relatively speaking. So some of our way of assessing that question, I think is probably going to prove to not age well. You know, and I think a lot of my own personal anxieties about digital books, uh, a lot of them, I don't think have been borne out by the reality. Uh, but I, the physical form of the codex is I want to say a better technology in certain respects. There is said for the the physical, uh, you know, as we want to say, an, an incarnational embodied format for human beings who, by their nature, dwell physically, you know, in an embodied way. And so I think that we see reflections of that. So you 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 get this in social science a lot where we're being told, you know, it turns out uh, it's better to read physical books or it's better to write with your hands and not type or things like that. And um, 
I think there's something to all of that. Although, you know, I also, as a person who's been typing and using online texts for as long as it's been possible, it's, you can overstate those things. But I uh, kind of defaulting more and more towards physical books whenever possible. And doing that, not really for any sort of ideological reason, but just because there's a there's just a way of, of familiarizing yourself with the text when you interact with it that way. And you can underline passages and you can interact in that way, even folding a page, which I wouldn't do, but a person could you know, do that. Um, I think there's just something to be said for that. Now, having said it, there is just no question that the advantages in terms of uh, like cross-referencing, all the analytical stuff that we do with texts. Uh, digital books have opened up just worlds in that regard. And so all of that, I think, is, is so I'm, you know, anxious that people are, are in my sermons reading the Bible on their phones. Uh, I'm not worried that if pastors are all using you know, software instead of giant codexes that we're losing some important part of our tradition. Um, I just think there are probably certain things that the codex as technology is, is better at. And it has to do with our humanity. You're successfully avoiding being doctrinaire, and I don't think you're doing it just because you're talking to somebody who's literally standing in the offices of Logos Bible Software in Bellingham, Washington. I, I think you mean what you say, and I agree with you. I, I feel like the Codex is a technology. It just happened to have come along a lot, lot before the digital technology, but like all technologies, it has its place and things it's good at, and digital technology likewise. And I think people are calming down about this. I don't see them freaking out as much. Although at the last Bible Tech conference, I think I counted like six different addresses, including one I delivered that were basically on this theme. But that itself made me feel like, okay, maybe we actually do need to just calm down because the, all the bad stuff we were worried about happening when digital Bibles replaced paper Bibles is just not happening. And the most people in church, in my experience, are still carrying uh, paper Bible and still using that primarily. I, was say, I, I think that's true. I think it, it, uh, it varies, you know, and I, I speaking in different contexts, I see a lot of, uh, of use of digital Bibles, but I, I see a lot of it in, in places where you don't have any other uh, option, you know, because people don't tote books around with them everywhere they go. And so ironically, I think the, the digital text has made it possible for people to be referencing scripture contexts where in the past they wouldn't have been. Yeah, I, I like to listen to the Bible and the last two or three passes through scripture for me have just been audio Bibles. And a long time ago, I would have said that was cheating, but I really listen and I'm taking in Bible at times I just wouldn't. Um, so I'm like a dedicated user of Bluetooth devices because anytime I have free time, I'm, I want to be taking stuff in. And right now I'm listening through a New King James, um, you know, dramatized version of the Bible, although it's every, all, every word of the text is in it. It's actually played by different actors. I find that to be really useful. Now, your name has come up in our offices, I will have you know, because we have done some Bible design. We put out a Lexham English Septuagint about two years ago now, and I was part of that process, and that was a real thrill for me. I got to do the thing of pulling the levers of power that you were talking about, and on a scatter plot of, uh, of brainstorming ideas, we talked about referencing you. It didn't end up being the right project for that. That could happen someday. I'm just curious, has no publisher ever called you and said, here, take all the levers of power? You know, you run the Bible design blog, surely you can make a good Bible and you'll promote it for us. Has that ever happened? No, not not that way. So, I mean, I have had conversations, but, but not typically... Uh, you you bring the dream and we'll bring the resources typically it's it's let's meet somewhere in the middle and that's what makes it difficult because i am a like ideologically driven person when it comes to this 
agenda that I'm pushing for reader-friendly Bibles. And so it's difficult to uh, change. Like, like if I create an edition to reflect what I've written about. So if it has my name on it, but it's actually some other thing, it, that just won't make sense. So I think uh, I'm still waiting for that, that like we want to see what you would do if these barriers were removed. We've come close, but it just hasn't quite happened yet. I will keep that in mind. And I must say, you are ideologically driven as I am, but you're not an ideologue. You don't bring an arrogance to it that dismisses everything that's gone before that, or that you, you know, don't, that doesn't meet up to all your standards. And that makes you a lot easier to read and I think more effective. And I happen to know as I'm interviewing people from publishers for this piece, that you way more than me, but both of us in some of the work we've done over the years have actually made a difference. That publishers are silently listening in or sometimes not so silently. And they, I just had one tell me from a large company that she was gonna read all the comments on my Bible typography manifesto. She just wanted to know what are actual Bible users uh, saying? What, what are they saying that they want? So your work has made a difference. It's helped me over the years, and I just beg you for another post. Keep them coming. I will be reading it the day it comes out. And thank you so much for your time, J. Mark Bertrand. It's been a real pleasure to finally meet you in person through the magic of modern technology. Thank you. I've long admired J. Mark Bertrand. His Bible design blog is so classy. The photography was good. I envied him because publishers were sending him these beautiful Bibles that I wanted them to send to me. And now, as the editor of Bible Study Magazine, I was finally able to get them to send me some absolutely beautiful Bibles, various publishers did. And J. Mark Bertrand and his work popularizing the idea that Bibles actually should be beautiful. He's one of the reasons that I was able to ask for these beautiful Bibles. I'm grateful for his insight, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation.